Um, thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to uh, connect with us, uh, especially on this very important uh, webinar on the private sponsorship of refugees. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Lucia Maktar. I'll be uh, first uh, leading us in a land acknowledgement before we get started. Um, so I would like to first and foremost acknowledge that the work we do takes place on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Our regional hubs and partners across Canada similarly gather on the traditional territory of many indig Indigenous nations who have cared for these lands since time immemorial. Thank you. Um, so now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Wendy Sukir, who is the uh, founder of the Diversity Institute, um, as well as one of the co-founders of Lifeline Afghanistan. Uh, Dr. Wendy Sukir is a professor of entrepreneurship and strategy at the Ted Rogers School of Management and academic director of the Diversity Institute. Uh, she has led varying initiatives here and um, a lot of the success is owed to her uh, huge heart. So we'd like to uh, pass it to Dr. Wendy Sukir to lead us in this uh, webinar, uh, primarily starting on what is private sponsorship of refugees. Thanks so much. Ugh, sorry, my lighting is a bit bad today. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. And I'm wondering, um, should I try to share my screen, uh, Manera, or are you comfortable advancing yours? I'm comfortable, but please let me know if you want me to change the slides. Yeah, um, it might be faster if uh, if you let me share the screen. Um, okay. Great. Let me ask now. Perhaps you can just send Wendy the uh, updated webinar uh, PowerPoint, and then we can just get. I started. can. I've. Oh, okay. I think I'm good. Thanks. Um, okay, just if I have one moment. Oh, screen sharing has stopped. Let me try one more time. Apologies. Can you see my, can you see my, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So i um, very pleased to be here today and we really wanted to uh, walk you through uh, some basic information about private sponsorship. I know from recognizing some of the names of folks on the line that many of you are very experienced, but some of you may be new to private sponsorship. And so the intent of this webinar is really to provide an overview of what private sponsorship is about, um, share some experiences of people uh, who have been involved in private sponsorship, talk a bit about um, what uh, Lifeline Afghanistan can do to support folks who are interested in private sponsorship, and then give some time to questions and answers. So um, some of you may already know this, and I do apologize if it's too simple, but when we uh, think about refugees um, coming to Canada, there are a number of different vehicles that are available for them. The Canadian government, for example, often will extend offers to refugees, for example, as they have with um, many of the people uh, seeking refuge from Afghanistan. Uh, refugees also are eligible to apply for other economic pathways uh, to come to the country. Some use student visas or, or work permits. But there are also other mechanisms, and these are the ones we'll talk about most today. One is private sponsorship, 
which is essentially where Canadian citizens or um, permanent residents uh, get together and pledge resources and support uh, for the first year the refugees are in Canada. There are also uh, blended visa office refugees, which are sort of a combination of government sponsored and uh, privately government assisted and privately sponsored refugees where the government puts in some money and um, individuals put in others and private sponsorship is a uniquely Canadian um, uh, approach to addressing humanitarian crises. Uh, it was, I think, pioneered with the Indo-Chinese refugees in, um, in uh, 19, would have been 1978-79 with uh, um, Operation Lifeline, which uh, was incredibly successful. And over the last uh, decades, has been used to address the needs of refugees from all around the world. There was a big initiative, as many of you know, in 2015 targeting Syrian refugees. And more recently, there have been some measures put in place to support Afghan refugees. But anyone uh, who is considered a refugee is eligible for private sponsorship. It's just, you know, for some, it's easier than others. And privately sponsored refugees are uh, granted permanent residence status in Canada, which means that they can work, as well as settlement support. And there are a couple of different mechanisms that can be used in order to privately sponsor um, refugees, which we'll talk about more. The financial commitments vary with the size and composition of the, um, of the uh, families that are coming. And I will let Manera or Lucia correct me because I suspect this is um, this may have been updated. But typically, uh, a family of five would be require a commitment of around twenty three thousand dollars, whereas an individual would uh, require around eighteen thousand. And am I is the age eighteen or is it? Yes. Um, Yes, it is 18. Well, it's considered to be age of majority. So whoever is older than 18 uh, would be calculated differently as depending. Okay. It, so it, it, if a family has two adults, three kids, the financial commitment is in the neighborhood of 23,000, give or take. But if it's that family has an additional child over the age of 18, you have to add another $18,000 on top of it. So the, the financial commitments can vary quite considerably. And as I said, we've got 40 years experience of doing this and really good, wearing my researcher hat, um, very good um, results. One of the things that private sponsorship um, does is it provides refugees effectively with a family in Canada. That's how many describe it, which means that they have social capital, they have they have people to guide them, they have people to help them navigate all of the things that are so challenging, especially for people who have been traumatized. Uh, there's also really good evidence to suggest that the networks, the, the social capital that private sponsors provide really accelerates the process of um, adaptation of employment and of, uh, of settlement. And I can say, um, you know, having uh, led a sponsorship group in 1979, I have watched with my own eyes as that family um, settled and prospered and brought extended members of their family to Canada and has children, has produced children who are PhDs and engineers and, and accountants and um, are making major contributions to the Canadian economy. The other thing that I think is also something that um, people with private sponsorship experience will say, and I welcome comments from participants who have uh, been involved, is that often the sponsors feel that they derive as much benefit from the relationship as the refugees do. And, and 
lasting friendships are created. Environics Institute recently did a study of all Syrian refugees, um, not just those who are privately sponsored, and really, really underscored the success of that initiative in um, 2015. And you can, the numbers speak for themselves. 95% of respondents either were very satisfied or generally satisfied with their feeling of safety and security you know, 84% with acceptance and so on and so forth. So really, really strong indications that this is successful, not just for the refugees, but also for Canada. And we have some experience with this. Um, we were involved in setting up Lifeline Syria, which uh, Senator Ratna Almadvar created with the goal of privately sponsoring a thousand refugees in the GTA. And Ryerson University, under the leadership of Sheldon Levy, our former president, stepped up and initially made a commitment to sponsor 10 um, Syrian refugee families, which ended up being 100 um, and involving other, other universities. So in total, um, 500 uh, people um, were sponsored, $5 million were raised. And what was really interesting is students had opportunities to get lots of experience. Overall, um, 3 million Canadians, almost 10% of the population, indicated that they had some involvement with um, Syrian refugees. And we ourselves have some really interesting um, stories of success including you know, physicians who went through the process of getting their recertification are now serving um, communities that would not otherwise have access uh, to healthcare. My favorite story, one of the families we sponsored, uh, one of the kids got a job at a local fishing um, company in Picton, Ontario. You often think about refugees going to big centers. We settled them across the country. He is now, um, he is now trying to secure financing to buy the business as the owner is retiring. And if you're from a small town, you will know that in many small communities, succession for small businesses, for farms, et cetera, is a big issue. Refugees and newcomers help solve that. And of course, um, many people know the story of Peace by Chocolate. Um, and I think that what we have very good evidence that the experience with privately sponsoring uh, Syrian refugees was a really powerful antidote to Islamophobia. So when we think about the pathways and what's involved, there really there, there are a number of different things you can do, but the, the two simplest ones, and my colleagues will, will add uh, more, more detail, are to be part of a group of five and or to work with a sponsorship agreement holder. If you're part of a group of five, you have quite a lot of flexibility. You and four of your friends come together, you, uh, you, you pool resources or you provide evidence that you have the resources and uh, you can complete the paperwork to sponsor a refugee provided they are UNHCR designated or have paperwork from, a, from another state. This is really important because it's limiting in the sense that um, there have been barriers to people getting UNHCR designation. Many of the Afghans who left uh, 18 months ago are still waiting in places like Pakistan to try to get their paperwork. But there are also refugees who have been in camps for five years, places like Indonesia, who do have UNHCR designation. One of the things that the government of Canada did for Syrians that it has not done for Afghans is it basically said, if you're from Syria, we assume you're a refugee and you don't have to have the UNHCR designation. But once you've identified the, um, the, uh, the family that you want to um, support, and you can do that in a variety of ways. There are a number of things that you have to do. There's paperwork associated with the family, which has to document their identity, um, their eligibility, um, and so on, uh, you know, provide all sorts of, uh, of uh, 
documentation to the extent that it's available. And the sponsors have to provide evidence of their citizenship, being permanent residents, or if they have a status card, they have to provide a police record check. And they also have to show that they have the financial capacity to support the family based on these predetermined um, amounts. The second way that you can um, be a private sponsor is by working with a sponsorship agreement holder. And there are hundreds of these across the country. Often they're faith-based. So uh, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the United Church, the Mennonite Central Committee, um, um, many Jewish uh, organizations and many community groups like the Afghan Women's Organization have gone through the process to become sponsorship agreement holders. Sponsorship agreement holders are able to work with refugees who do not have the UNHCR designation. The unfortunate thing, particularly with respect to Afghans, is that there are very few positions available. Again, with the Syrian refugees, the government of Canada allocated additional spaces to sponsorship agreement holders to allow them to um, support um, Syrian refugees. They have not done that with, with Afghans. So, um, so trying to find sponsorship agreement holders with spaces that are available is something of a challenge. However, the processes are very similar. You have to demonstrate to the sponsorship agreement holder that you have the, um, the resources and the experience needed to sponsor the family. Same kind of evidence, same kind of proof, as well as the financial capability. Now, some sponsorship agreement holders want you to, to actually provide the money up front. Others will accept evidence, for example, a bank account with the required amount of money um, in it. So those are sort of the two ways in which you can get involved in private sponsorship of refugees. And there is um, lots more information, and you'll be getting some of this from our, our panel, from the Refugee Sponsorship Training Program, um, which is has all the information you could possibly want, as well as online courses and so on. And the RSTP was really set up to help sponsorship agreement holders, as well as people like us, navigate what can be a sort of complicated, um, a complicated system. So at this point, I'll hand it over to you, Licia, to introduce the panel. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, so we figured it would be best uh, for all the attendees here to really get um, um, a look into the personal narratives of those that were involved in the uh, private sponsorship pathway to give us all a better insight on what it would entail um, if you were part of a sponsoring group, if you supported in any capacity, or if you were on the receiving end of the PSR pathway. Uh, so we are joined here by uh, four panelists. Uh, the first one is Oranis Habibayar. She is a research assistant uh, with Lifeline Afghanistan uh, and has previously volunteered with Aura, who is a SAW. Uh, she has lived experience with the PSR pathway and the ways in which it has and continues to support her family and Afghans as a whole. Uh, and she is uh, on the team to leverage all of her expertise, um, both with Aura as well as her personal experience to provide um, the Lifeline Afghanistan team with support. We also have uh, Mohammed uh, Farid Basgir, who is a sponsored refugee and arrived to Canada uh, within a year, and he is joining the group of sponsors to resettle another group of refugees. So not only was he on the receiving end of this pathway, he is paying it forward by uh, supporting demographics that are um, needing of this support. He's a medical doctor with 26 years of experience in project management, addiction treatment, healthcare, and hospital management. And he uh, is currently serving as a member of the executive committee at Katiz Organization for Rehabilitation and a member of the Afghan expert group in the field of drug addiction. Wow, very impressive. Uh, we also have here uh, Maya Mori. 
Uh, she is the Settlement Support Connection Facilitator with RSTP and is based in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, May has extensive experience working closely with groups of five and community sponsors in her previous role uh, as a trainer in the GTA. In her current role with RSTP, she facilitates the connection between the sponsors and their sponsored refugees and uh, service provider organizations uh, for overall assessment, uh, settlement and integration of refugees into Canada. And our last but not least uh, panelist is Jenny King. Uh, Jenny King is the pastor at St. Michael and All Angels Church uh, and has worked directly with the uh, Aura, Aura Saw. Um, she is known as Director of Community Building and Spiritual Engagement. Uh, she's actively engaged with helping the church find ways to connect with the community. And part of this work uh, entails uh, promoting refugee sponsorship. Uh, the church is currently involved in sponsoring four families, three from Afghanistan and one from Eritrea. Uh, Jenny also leads the food bank and other programs to the church that address the mental, emotional and physical as well as spiritual well-being of the community. Uh, so in regards to the previous slide about RSTP, I'm going to first um, pass it along to Maya Mori uh, just to provide an overall uh, overview, a uh, high level of the RSTP program and the ways in which it has supported members of the community and members of the sponsoring group with this initiative. Thank you, May. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, meeting. Um, so, uh, and uh, welcome everyone who joined. Uh, it's a, a very good, you know, uh, topic is the uh, private sponsorship of refugee. And thank you, Dr. Wendy, for all the information. Uh, very um, helpful that you shared with us. Um, so our program, Refugee Sponsorship Training Program, is actually funded by IRCC, Immigration Refugee uh, um, Citizenship Canada. And we are um, administered the program at the Catholic Cross-Cultural Services and Immigration uh, Settlement Organization. Um, so we, we are a national program, uh, meaning we have... Uh, staff uh, located in all the provinces except for Quebec. So any information um, I share with you, uh, any information related to our program is applicable to all provinces except for Quebec. Uh, so we have trainers across the provinces, as I mentioned, and we actually support private uh, refugee sponsorship groups uh, and organizations. Organizations meaning the uh, sponsorship agreement holders, their constituent groups or church groups, and the co-sponsors working under their agreement as well. Um, along with the, we support groups of five uh, sponsors and community sponsors as well. So what, what do we do? We provide live uh, workshops and training sessions for sponsors. Uh, so we have webinars, live webinars, monthly, uh, a series of monthly webinars that we repeat. So every month. So every month you go on our website, www.rstp.ca, under the training tab, uh, you will find uh, uh, list of webinars, workshops, what workshops in person. So gradually we're going back to in-person uh, training sessions and information sessions for sponsors and public in general who are interested in the uh, sponsorship, private sponsorship of refugees. And the webinars are live webinars. So meaning if you join the webinar, you will uh, get the opportunity to ask questions at the end of each webinar. Um, and these webinars are repeated, as I mentioned, every month. So every month, the first day or even before first day or two days of the month, you will find and that webinars uh, on our website list uh, of the webinars uh, that will be delivered during each month and you will get the opportunity to register for the webinar and join the webinar. Um, we, we do online uh, training courses as well. So if someone wants to know more and uh, about the private sponsorship of refugees um, program, uh, you can also under the training tab, there is an option for uh, e-course and there is an entry level 
course for uh, an overview of the private sponsorship of refugees and there is also uh, an advanced uh, course advanced level course uh, a prerequisite will be the entry level uh, certificate and then you will uh, enroll for the advanced course. If, if you are uh, a settlement staff, settlement worker, professional or counselor, there is another course as well, e-training e-course with the certificate for uh, settlement workers who are interested to learn more and uh, who will be um, equipped to work with the privately uh, with, the, with the sponsors along with the newcomers who are sponsored under the PSR and PVOR program. So PSR is um, uh, short for uh, private sponsorship of refugees. Um, so we do these uh, e-training courses online and uh, we provide information and guidance for uh, interested public, who, whoever interested in the, uh, in, in the private sponsorship of refugees during the Lifeline Syria program or um, in, back in 2015, uh, we provided so many uh, public uh, information sessions on the private sponsorship of refugees and we will continue to do so now now uh, the in-person meeting is uh, uh, back uh, available, uh, uh, an available option for us. Uh, so we provide also training materials and guides um, that's available on our website. Uh, we have lots of helpful resources on our website, fact sheets. Uh, we have a, a calculator, online calculator for, uh, so Dr. Wendy, you mentioned like how it depends on the size of the family uh, and the composition and the, the ages of the children. You have different calculation for the financial, uh, the level of financial support. So we built a, a calculator, online calculator on our website, accessible from our website. So you just put the information the province, the composition of the family, the ages of the children, and the calculator will do the calculation for you. Of course, there is an option to put other details for in-kind donations and um, all other details. Um, we, we do also provide updates and information sharing, uh, updates that we receive from IRCC. Uh, on the program, on the requirement, or any new rules or regulations, uh, change of policy, uh, all that. So we keep uh, public informed uh, uh, of these updates. Um, you can receive our updates by subscribing from our website to our newsletter. So we, we do send uh, newsletters uh, frequently. And we there is a, a, a private sponsorship uh, of refugees list like PSR uh, list serve so you can add we can add your email you can subs subscribe to this list so you can stay up to date with any uh, news and updates and uh, uh, changes of policy on regulations or requirements uh, um, that we receive uh, from IRCC. And we respond to your individual uh, inquiries. So we have, if you go on our website and locate the under the contact us option, you will find list of provinces and for each province, who is the trainer, the main trainer for each province. So you can contact in, uh, uh, either by phone or by email that specific trainer in your region. Uh, for any questions uh, regarding the private sponsorship of refugees, any guidance you need, we are available in all the provinces. Uh, we also review application forms. So, for example, after you complete the application package and before you submit to IRCC, uh, to ROCO, to Resettlement Operations Center in Ottawa, by email, uh, before you submit your email with the application forms, uh, you're welcome to contact the trainer in your uh, region uh, so we can book an appointment either in person or uh, virtually to review all these application forms and make sure give you feedback uh, about the 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 uh, the content not the content I mean about the if there is any missing information or if there is any missing document, uh, any um, any area that you need to address uh, that will uh, lead to a better chances of a, a positive decision um, rather than return or refusal uh, by the officer, uh, we will give you feedback. 
uh, and guide you on the best way to address any uh, mistakes or errors or missing information. Um, I think, uh, yeah, and if, uh, if you if you have any questions regarding the uh, uh, private sponsorship of refugees, you're welcome to contact us. As I mentioned, I will drop in the chat the link to contact us um, uh, to contact our uh, you know the team member in your area, and uh, feel welcome to connect with us. Uh, my responsibility is actually my role is to connect the. If you have someone uh, you, you're expecting an arrival or someone arrived already, like that you sponsored, you're welcome to connect with me and I will make sure to connect you with a settlement worker or counselor that will, uh, as, will, will help you with the settlement support component. And uh, one more uh, last thing I would like to mention if I have time, uh, Lucia. Uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, just um, in, in regards to time, yeah, about, yes. more so. thank you so much. Maybe. Okay, I just, well, just yeah, one more thing that we have, we have a meeting actually, IRCC staff are coming to Toronto, if, um, are the attendees all from the GTA or this is a national? Uh... Our, our network um, is across um, the, the nation, so uh, oh, okay. we have a lot of um, diverse attendees here. Okay, so we have actually um, two uh, upcoming sessions with IRCC. Um, that's uh, one of them is um, to uh, invite the groups of five and community sponsors to this meeting that will happen in Toronto on the 7th, March, March 7th, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. at our location. I'll drop the address in the chat as well, and the registration link, because you have to register if you're a group, part of groups of five of community sponsors, you're welcome to attend, and you can ask actually directly IRCC staff uh, questions online, uh, mm -hmm. or if there is any specific case, like you, you need a, uh, you know, um, uh, clarification or so it is like a, a casual meeting uh, with uh, uh, organized by RSTP and IRCC and you're welcome to attend so I'll I'll drop the in the chat the dates of of these meetings and the registration link and um, if if there are any questions at the end are welcome uh, I'll thank you be available to uh, to answer any questions Thank, thank you, you Lucia, so for this opportunity. Of course, of course, and thank you. And um, we'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, but RSTP and CCS is um, part of our network here, and CCS is one of our founding partners. So we really at Lifeline Afghanistan leverage all of our contacts um, to be able to support this pathway. So we're very glad to have the RSTP team here today to shed light on the ways in which they can guide us um, through this process. Um, now, in regards to uh, the panel and specific to uh, the individual narratives, like I mentioned, uh, we have here Oranos, um, May, uh, Mohammed Farid, and Jenny, um, and I will be just asking uh, varying questions to shed light on this pathway and feel free um, to answer whenever you see fit. Uh, so the first element, the first question, sorry, uh, kind of surrounds the advantages for refugees. Uh, so what would be the advantages for refugees as a whole um, for this pathway? Um, so perhaps Oranos and Mohamed Farid, given that you uh, both arrived here as refugees to Canada, perhaps you can shed light on what the uh, PSR pathway means to you and um, perhaps speaking on what it, what it would mean to refugees to come. Thank you. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, <laughs> my experience is uh, quite different from others because our uh, case was very quickly. Uh, we received response from uh, IRCC and within a few months, we invited for, uh, not in a few months, just in a few days, we invited for uh, biometric and medical checkup and uh, we were planned to come to Canada easily from Pakistan but at that time uh, some things uh, between Canada and uh, Canadian government and Pakistan government happened that our uh, trip to Canada was postponed there were two flights uh, charter flights were cancelled and it again took a long time 
yeah. Uh, finally, we arrived here, and uh, we are happy that uh, the team, a team of five, they are very kind people. We are lucky because all of them are like we selected some people from the world and they come in our team. And they are, they are, they are very cooperative and uh, they prepare anything we wanted here. Um, the house in the first time and uh, the other official issue, we solve it easily. And um, the good thing in our family that uh, we uh, have no lingual uh, uh, barriers and that was easy to communicate with the community and the people. So we easily find a way. Uh, the best thing we found uh, here in Canada that there is no mm, discrimination uh, of color, religion, and um, lingual and other and other in the community we are living here. We every day we uh, visit different people from different uh, uh, ethnic and lingual um, the ground. And up to now, we face no any problem. Um, and uh, Uranus can say more about that. Maybe she have, but we are happy here. Uh, the security, um, the kindness of the people. Uh, so that's all. Incredible. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And I just want to touch upon, you, you mentioned Lucky. I, I think uh, to expand on that, I think as Canadians who are, you know, we're privileged to be here. It's our moral duty to be able to support in any capacity, um, even if it's just emotional support or support to get um, newcomers acquainted with the community. Um, we are all able to support in varying capacities. Um, and I'm glad that you touched upon that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pass it on to Arenas to share uh, the experience of refugees and how they can benefit from the PSR pathway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for creating this opportunity, Lucia, and thank you, Dr. Sukir and uh, May for your presentations. And also thank you, Mohamed Farid, for sharing your story. Um, uh, I will share a little bit of my uh, experiences as a refugee and my engagement with the sponsorship uh, process, private sponsorship process. And um, I would say that uh, when you become a refugee, a displaced person, uh, you experience one of the worst feelings of the world. And it's feeling, uh, it's the feeling of loneliness and that you're alone and you don't have um someone to care for you or support you and you gradually lose your hope and I think with a sponsorship and with the sponsors they they kind of prevent these feelings from happening and they tell you that there is hope and there is humanity and there are people who care about you and they tell you that you too matter as a human, you too matter, uh, and you are important. And um, for me, uh, and especially for my family that were sponsored, and they were supported by Aura, Anglican United Refugee Alliance, and also Lifeline Afghanistan and the Sejadia Trust, they were supported to the sponsorship program and also the um, SAW program. Uh, I think for us, um, sponsorship is the ultimate expression of humanity, the ultimate expression of love and empathy. And um, it is very important to support people who need that support, especially when they leave behind their loved ones, when they leave behind their families, their home of birth, and their friends. Um, yeah, this is this is my experience. And um, do you want me to also answer to the other questions in the chat? Or you will explain that? Uh, I, I will touch upon them, but um, yeah. thank you so much, Aranis, so for, for shedding light on that and letting us have uh, maybe even half a percent of what it what it means to be on the receiving end of, of this process. Um, so thank you very much for, for sharing that. Uh, my next question is to uh, Jenny, um, and this regards, um, if you could please shed light on what is the impact on sponsors if they were to be um, affiliated with this pathway for refugees? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> the impact on sponsors. Um, so I'm part of a team and as the pastor at St. Michael and All Angels, I have my sort of my fingers in many, many pots, but I've been so fortunate in that sort of like one of my fingers has been very much in the part of working with refugee resettlement. And what I have seen, what I can speak about personally, what I have felt, and then I'm going to also say what I have seen and witnessed in those that have stepped forward. Um, because sort of being in team lead, I get to really see that. And I've been able to witness people feeling that they're useful again. You know, people wondering, I've had people saying to me, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And I say, okay, well, whilst you're figuring that out, do you want to see if you can find some beds for this family that needs beds, you know? And then suddenly as they're figuring out and trying to find the beds, they're starting to find the purpose in life and they're starting to find hope themselves in a time when it can be, I mean, the world is hard. We know that the world is really harsh and people are looking for ways to be of help to see the hope and pass it on. Um, I myself personally, I've been able to witness uh, with the with the families that we've been working alongside. Um, Fareed is one of the families uh, and it's been fantastic to walk with him and his wife and four children. Um, and also others, just to be able to see um, that the hope, that you were just speaking of, just the hope and being able to see that vice versa. I mean, um, I would say that are there struggles? Yes, at times there are, because how do you find the next step? How do you have, you know, I've heard when we were looking for the permanent housing, I've heard people on the team being like, oh, you know, like, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Where are we going to find it? Where are we going to find it? And then it comes comes through so that's amazing um i've only seen growth in in the teams i've heard that there's also sometimes struggles within the teams and that's fantastic to hear about refugee sponsorship training program um you know like and, and all the incredible partnerships that happen to help support through those moments of not knowing which way forward um but I can say that my life is safe. I know what safety is. I want that for everybody. And if I can be part of a sponsorship team that helps to bring in, even if it's just one family or one individual and help bring them into a place of safety where they can breathe again without being afraid of what's behind them or what's in front of them or beside them, then I'd wanna see that happen can't change the world, but we can change the pocket of the world that's right in front of our face. Thank you uh, very much, Jenny. That is absolutely incredible. And even to touch upon, um, you know, the privilege that we have to be here in Canada and um, recognize and live through safety and how we can utilize that privilege to provide um, a sense of hope for those that weren't afforded the same luxuries as us. Um, so it's absolutely incredible to see like-minded individuals like yourself who are just providing that hope to those that, um, you know, have, have lost it because of the circumstances that were imposed onto them. Um, I do have a, uh, another question, and this could be for um, all panelists here. Um, beyond, um, I'm sure how rewarding it is to be part of this process. Um, may I also ask, uh, were there other motivating factors um, that prompted you to get involved in this process? And what are the ways in which um, attendees here can uh, further get engaged beyond, um, you know, maybe financial commitments or um, what other ways can they support and be involved in this process from your experience? Yes, Jenny, go ahead, please. So um, I'll, I will say what got me involved in the very first place myself, the church already had been prior to me being here as a pastor working with a Syrian refugee family and a group, um, a local community group. Um, but for me personally, I'll tell you about that. And then the second part of your question. Oh, yes. 
uh, for, for the attendees here, uh, just to give them further insight on the ways in which they can get involved um, beyond maybe financial commitments and social support, what other ways can Canadians um, be a part of the, the success of the PSR pathway? Um, why I got involved. Uh, oftentimes a church, and I am certain synagogues and mosques must receive the same as well. It's sort of like mass emails from people who are in who are in refugee circumstances somewhere in the world, just looking for anybody to help, any way to get out of the circumstances. About three and a half years ago, we received an email here that burned into my heart very, very quickly. And I couldn't tell you why, but I couldn't put the email down. And it was from a young woman from um, Iran, and she was writing on behalf of herself and her mother. Now, I could not, I couldn't help her. You know, she wasn't yet, we, we, we didn't know who she was, but I couldn't not respond to that email. And so I wrote back to her and I said, you know, forgive me, I'm, I can't change your circumstance right now, but I need you to know your story has been heard. Somebody in the world is holding out hope for you. Your story has been heard. And Saba is her name. Saba wrote back and she said, that's exactly what I needed to hear because I felt like no one was listening. And so for the next year, Saba and I communicated by email and then by phone on WhatsApp and just, just to let her know, like, somebody's rooting for you, girl, you know? And I think that's a massive part of what this all is, is, you know, you ask about what we can do. We can root for people. <laughs> we can actually connect with people and say, I root for you. Like, I believe it's possible. Um, and then after a year, we were given permission to sponsor Saba and her mom and her sister, which was incredible. The same week as we were given permission, and this was during COVID, they also received emergency resettlement status from UNHCR. So they had to make a decision. Come with us, sponsorship agreements, private ones could take two to three years at that point in time because of COVID, or go with the emergency resettlement that could be in eight months. Saba obviously went with the eight month resettlement. They are resettled in Spain, but their relationship still continues. And she said, please offer our space to somebody else. Keep it open. And that's been the journey. That's what got me like etched on my heart. How we can be involved. Again, I think really importantly on a sort of on a fundamental level, just believe that it's possible. Start off with that. When somebody just needs an ear, they need support to know like somebody cares. That's that's actually really, really, you know, we know that that's critical. It's just human to human. And then the ways to get involved. We we are in a position where we almost capped what we need to raise financially. So we're in a position for the next, actually for Fareed's wife's sister and her family. We're in the position to, we're just finishing up the financial, financial piece. But then there's joining groups and saying, okay, you know what? We need to have furniture. We need to look for, look for physical home spaces that you know the city of Toronto how much is that for rent it's not cheap it's not anywhere but city of Toronto is not so all of those pieces that's what I would say thus far incredible thank you again uh Jenny and I think it's important to know what you said about just wanting to know that someone out there cares because as Aranis uh, mentioned, there is an overwhelming feeling of loneliness when this circumstance is imposed on you. Um, so it's important and huge to know that someone out there maybe not understands what you're going through, but empathizes and is trying to navigate any opportunity just to present to you um, maybe a pathway to, to a better life, hope, uh, an opportunity for you to know that someone truly cares um, and your suffering isn't, um, you know, not being recognized. So thank you so much, uh, Jenny. Uh, we have time uh, for a few more comments. So uh, perhaps May or Aranas and, and uh, Farid, if you guys would like to um, share any, any final comments um, about what it means to be part of the PSR pathway, either on the receiving end or uh, facilitating in the support, either through training or uh, supporting with applications or spaces or social and emotional support, whatever you see uh, fit, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, I can go. Um, thank you. 
um, it has been very rewarding for me working with uh, closely with the sponsors. Um, as Syrian Canadian, I got involved myself in, in sponsorship of uh, multiple sponsorships, actually. And uh, it was so rewarding, not on a personal level that I, I was able to sponsor uh, some friends or relatives or uh, other acquaintances, but as well as a, on a professional level, uh, I can't tell you how much joy it brought to my uh, to me. Like the process, uh, meeting with um, you know families. Uh, I remember this uh, Afghan lady came to my office one time, and tears in her eyes, and she couldn't hold her tears back because how much she felt the pain. Um, she she felt you know she is here safe and happy with her family but her happiness is not complete of course and as many of us here uh, uh, so her sister was in, in a refugee uh, situation with with her husband and, uh, uh, and 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 she couldn't really believe that how can she continue or she couldn't um enjoy her life, um, uh, daily life, without thinking of her sister and her situation. And um, her sister didn't have a, a, a refugee status to be sponsored in the groups of five. And uh, of course, I we, with RSTP, we always help them navigate the different sponsors, uh, sponsorship agreement holders, and we guide them how to, you know, prepare the story, um, you know, um, uh, try to meet in person with the, uh, you know, with the well, someone representative from the organization, because I'm sure the, uh, the SARS are overwhelmed, you know, thinking of, uh, how many refugees we have now, like looking for resettlement, I think uh, 32.5 million refugees in the world, see, looking for a sponsorship for, for resettlement. So uh, you can imagine the amount of, you know, uh, requests uh, the sponsorship agreement holders receive. Uh, so if you, you need to make an extra, so we, we kind of, I guided her, like she need to, to do extra effort, like to go and, you know, speak in person, uh, explain her situation, the situation of her sister. Anyways, to make sh short, uh, long story short, in, in a short time, while she was looking, navigating the SARS, um, her sister received uh, the uh, refugee status and she was able to sponsor her and their uh, 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 groups of five sponsorship. And, um, you know, when, when she called me back and of course we guided her with the, uh, with the applications, um, she wanted to go to a lawyer and, uh, you know, spend X amount of dollars and, I told her, you know, if you attend our sessions and uh, we will guide you, we will review the application for you, of course, at no cost, because we're funded, you know, uh, work for for um, CCS, which is funded by um, IRCC. So our service is at no cost. So she was, you know, she was, you know, she agreed and she started the application and you know, I can't describe the joy when she called me after, of course, uh, uh, a while to tell me I have a great news for you and I'm welcoming my sister and her husband. And now she has, you know, even her sister has a, a baby coming with her. And you can see, you know, you can hear her like voice so happy and cheerful. And, you know, now she can sit and relax, of course, for a short time because other family members still needs resettlement. But you know, sometimes we just support them emotionally just to let them know that, you know, the process is is lengthy. It's not really, it's not going to happen overnight. And, you know, what we experience, what we witness as well, like they, uh, myself and everyone involved in this uh, process, that we feel guilty sometimes. And uh, we, we need to, you know, we feel guilty because we live here in safety and we feel guilty that other family members or relatives are not in the same situation. But at the same time, what we try to, you know, when communicate information with the sponsors and family members who are interested to sponsor is to let them know, like it, it's, it's not, yes, 
you feel guilty and your probably relatives or family members pressuring, you know, asking for, you know, bring us soon, but you can do so much and you within your control is just so much. So you can't really, um, you have to manage the expectation of the family members overseas who are waiting. Um, just stay in touch with them. Just let them know that you're doing your best because, um, you know, certain things, you know, with COVID, who knew that this is coming? For two years, the process got delayed on, on all levels here and overseas. That's out of our control. So it's always good we help them to manage and we have actually a, a specific session on managing expectations so managing our expectations um in the process and managing our relatives overseas um their expectations as well so that will probably help you know uh, a little bit uh, ease the stress and the burden on us as sponsors and our on our relatives and help them understand what we can do and we, what we can't do. Um, so, and yeah, so uh, it has been rewarding and um, uh, I really enjoy uh, working with the different um, uh, sponsors and, um, you know, I, I see how the how, how the impact on, you know, the service we provide, the information we, we provide at RSTP and how it is helpful and makes a difference, uh, whether they can do it right away or they're working on the process and taking it step at a time, one step at a time. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I would like to share with you. Thank you so much, May. You're really welcome. Appreciate your, your insight. Um, we have about one minute uh, before we wrap up uh, this component of the webinar. Um, I will leave it to the remaining panelists if they would like to share uh, final words. Uh, yes, Aranis, uh, just with the interest of time, we have about a, a minute or so left. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Yeah, I will be brief. Um, just I want to say that it is one thing to know something as a theory, and it is one thing to know something as a uh, second hand and uh, experience but it is another thing to live as a refugee and to have that first hand experience and you ask that why I uh, like what is the reason that I'm involved in this process I believe that I know the pain I have been in a refugee camp for nine months and I know the struggle that people are going to and their experiences resonate in me. And I just want to say that uh, for me, working with organizations that support refugees, working with SARS, working with Aura and with Lifeline Afghanistan is not just a career or it's not just a profession. For me, it's a, it's a responsibility. And uh, I think that there aren't so many people in the world who want to find a solution for, for refugees, find a solution for their struggles. But uh, I want to be part of that solution. I want to advocate for them and help them. Um, I know that they have an unpredictable situation, but all they want to have is stability and they are thirsty of education. They are thirsty of learning of working in a new community and they they want that safety and stability in their life uh just to briefly talk about it, um what uh jenny mentioned uh, how we can help uh if we cannot participate in organization in in supporting in uh, settlement of refugees uh mm, for me a girl mm, the name her, like her name was Daniel. She helped me get out of Afghanistan, but I ended up in a refugee camp for nine months and I was alone. My family was not there, but there were times that I was so desperate and I was just texting her that uh, they are not calling me for my interviews. I cannot go for my biometrics. It's taking so long. And all she was saying is that uh, you're strong, you're powerful, I know that you can do it. I know that you have the strength to stay there. And her words were always a cure for my pain. And her support was always something that gave me that relief. 
and I was f- feeling so good that yes, she cares and she is there. She was telling me that I'm sorry, I cannot help, I cannot contact them, but I know that you can stay there and you have the strength. And I know that I'm going to support you in any way that is possible. And that was that was a huge support for me emotionally. And uh, yeah, I think we all can contribute in that. Thank you so much again for your questions. Thank you so much, um, Aranis. I, I think it's absolutely incredible uh, that you've shared this experience with us. I, I can't even imagine um, what that must have been like uh, in terms of the nine months and the circumstances that led you to flee. Um, but I, I think it's important that you touched upon this is beyond a, a nine to five uh, for a lot of us. And we are deeply passionate about supporting this cause. Um, and we call on uh, you know our attendees here to support us in supporting this demographic because we can't do it alone. It's a collective effort. Um, and that's why we are hosting, you know, a webinar like this to provide you information on how you can contribute and how you can make a difference in, in many lives. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your experience, your insights, um, and uh, really appreciate your time here with us today. Um, so uh, I will now be touching upon uh, the work that we do with Lifeline Afghanistan uh, to give everyone here further insight in our initiative. Uh, so Lifeline Afghanistan uh, came to be uh, following the crisis that emerged in August of 2021. I'm sure we're all familiar uh, with the crisis and that it's one of the world's largest populations of persons displaced by conflict and human rights violations. Uh, 2.3 million Afghan refugees have bled to neighboring states uh, forcefully, uh, and primarily they are in uh, Iran and Pakistan, and they are also internally displaced within Afghanistan, totaling uh, 3.5 million. Uh, half of the population is enduring um, human rights violations, poverty, famine, uh, limited employment opportunities. There is certainly, and I can say this um, from the um, experience of our um, Afghan nationals that work on the team. There is a war on women as well within the region. Uh, so that's also important to note. And there are limited opportunities for international and humanitarian aid due to the criminal code that currently exists. Uh, so any support that would be filtered through or funneled through Afghanistan would be considered supporting a terrorist organization. So internationally, our hands are tied in terms of what we can support. Uh, and like I mentioned, Taliban's assault on the rights of women and girls, there is no opportunity to work, to be um, educated. Uh, they are silenced in every capacity and any um, activism efforts are um, met with resistance, persecution, or threats of persecution. So uh, Lifeline Afghanistan uh, came to fruition in response to this crisis uh, that has emerged in August of 2021. Of course, the um, various concerns within the region have been ongoing for decades, uh, but this specific crisis um, allowed for the development of Lifeline Afghanistan. So what we do here is uh, we build awareness and engagement of civil society in the sponsorship of Afghan refugees, uh, like the webinar here today. Uh, we provide resources and connect with organizations uh, that are supporting the Afghan demographic, uh, either with humanitarian relief, advocacy, settlement, research, and other important work. We work with various uh, sponsorship agreement holders like Aura and others to engage Canadians in the private sponsorship uh, pathway and provide support along the whole process. Uh, we support with skills assessments and trauma-informed approaches. We work with employers and service providers to create pathways, and we promote um, evidence-based, innovative, and collaborative approaches to supporting the refugee demographic. So it's important to note that our efforts are quali qualitative in nature, sorry, in that uh, we want to ensure the success of these individuals once they arrive to Canada. We're not only um, motivated to bring them here, we want to ensure that they are integrated meaningfully into the society, into the labor market, and all elements of their life to ensure a uh, high quality of life here in Canada. Uh, next slide, please, Munara. Uh, so we have varying uh, founding partners that supported with the um, birth of Lifeline Afghanistan, and they are listed here. Um, and uh, we thank them all for their efforts. And this is our 
network and it's continually expanding in terms of the support we provide in Canada and uh, internationally. Uh, next slide, please, Minara. So how can we uh, help you in, in helping us? Um, so there are various obligations uh, in the private sponsorship pathway, and we support in connecting these individuals to meet the uh, various obligations. So we can match people who have the heart with those that have the heart and finances, with those that have the capacity to provide social support, emotional support, and like I said, all other elements to ensure their success as they integrate into the community. Uh, we support the formation of sponsoring groups. So sponsoring groups can vary in terms of the type of support that they provide. Uh, we have the capacity to identify refugees in need with our network. We are able to raise funds through our donation page uh, that is available on lifelineafghanistan.ca, and um, I'm sure the link has been shared and we can continue to share it. Uh, we mobilize volunteers to help with translation and other services, so we really do want to support um, in terms of practicing what we preach. So not only are we ensuring that um, Afghan nationals are employed within various Canadian organizations, we also employ and um, provide that support. And we also want to leverage the many skills that Afghan volunteers have uh, to be able to support this demographic as well. In addition to assisting with uh, settlement training and employment. So our employment services extend to uh, leveraging the Afghan job seeker demographic in uh, detailing their assets, their skills, their education, and we match them directly with uh, employers that are wanting to diversify their workforces and create opportunities specifically for the Afghan demographic. So we are constantly trying to provide uh, meaningful employment opportunities beyond survival jobs and really integrate these individuals into the labor market meaningfully. And we build the community. Um, we really connect Afghans to one another and ensure their success and their presence in Canada is recognized and celebrated here. Uh, next slide, please. So how can uh, how you can help us? Uh, so volunteering is huge in terms of mentorship, coaching, and supporting newcomers in any way that you see fit. No support is too small. No support is too little. Like I said, this is um, <coughs> excuse me. This is a uh, collective responsibility. Uh, you can join a sponsoring group. You can organize your own sponsorship group. Uh, you can donate your time, money, space, goods, like Jenny mentioned, uh, if it's furniture, if it's uh, goods around the house. And of course, with employment opportunities, if you have the capacity to um, create spaces where Afghans can be employed in your organizations, uh, that would be hugely beneficial. They come with a wide array of skills, education, and experience, and we really want to leverage everything that they have to offer to ensure their success, uh, as well as their contribution to the Canadian economy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this brings us to the end of our um, presentation. Uh, for the webinar here today, uh, but we want to encourage everyone to uh, get in touch uh, directly on uh, lifelineafghanistan.ca to uh, gather further information on ways in which you can contribute to the cause, either with your time, with your finances, in any other way. Uh, please feel free to direct any questions or, <coughs> excuse me, further queries to our info box, which is lifelineafghanistan at torontomu.ca. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, team that uh, filters through these questions on a daily basis, and we will get back to you in, in, in good time. <laughs> uh, I can promise that. Uh, and please feel free to connect any anytime that you see fit. Uh, I will pass it to uh, Dr. Sikir for uh, closing remarks and any other comments she wishes to make uh, before we close off this presentation. Thanks so much. I mean, that was just uh, amazing. And it's uh, you know, someone asked early on um, what motivates people to be involved, and I, I think um, lots of folks, lots of folks know that in the GTA, half the population was born outside of Canada, and the other the other uh, half is um, half people who were children of people born in Canada, and half people who are born outside of Canada. So if you look at the GTA, three quarters of us were either born outside of Canada or the children of people born outside of Canada. And I myself am the child of a refugee. And that was what motivated me to get involved with um, 
the Indo-Chinese refugees and, and, and the Syrian refugees and then the Afghan refugees and many people on the panel have that uh, lived experience either of being refugees or watching the struggles of um, refugees have come to Canada. So I think for sure, many of us have personal motivations that, um, that run deep. But I do think increasingly, um, people are starting to recognize that newcomers to Canada offer more to us <laughs> than we offer to them. And this is a, you know, this is a narrative that is not, in my view, shared often enough um, but it's something that I, I do think that increasingly we really have to um, ensure people understand Canada needs immigrants, Canada needs newcomers, Canada needs refugees, and increasingly we're completing, we're keep competing globally for, um, for talent. We have a, a million unfilled jobs in this country. So the, the economic imperative for um, bringing people to this country, I think, is something that we have to consider along with the um, important uh, humanitarian considerations, along with the personal reasons many of us um, may um, have for getting involved. And, and the, the final thing I want to say is you can do as much or as little as you want. I mean, one of the most powerful, one of the most powerful things someone can do for a newcomer or a refugee, um, as, as many, have many have said, is just small amounts of time, conversations, helping to navigate things that are very unfamiliar. From my perspective, um, we know that most jobs in Canada are not advertised. And from my perspective, employment is one of the key drivers, not just of economic well-being or social well-being, but also mental health. And so, you know, one of the easiest things you can do is volunteer to help someone with their resume, introduce them to someone you know might be hiring, answer their questions on what your job is and, um, and what it would take to, to get employment. That's, that's a very, very light um, level of, of involvement. People can donate, people can donate um, in addition to their time, they can donate money, but they can also donate goods and services. You know, it was, uh, I remember it was Thanksgiving weekend a couple of years ago when we got a call from one of the agencies serving refugees at the airport and they said, people are here in sandals and slippers, we need shoes. I almost never did do this, but I posted one message on LinkedIn and I said, we need shoes for people at the airport. <laughs> I have pictures of my house full of shoes. We we were we hoped we would get three or four hundred pairs. We got twelve hundred pairs of shoes. Some people went to shoe stores and bought new shoes. Went to you know Walmart and bought new boots. It was unbelievable. And that was one email post that I made on LinkedIn. So I think sometimes we think about. Um, these only these activities only based on the the big investments, joining a sponsorship group, committing committing funding, committing to supporting a family for for a year. That's the gold standard. There are all sorts of small steps that you can take along the way to help support um, uh, families. We have people who have time. We have people who have money. We have people who have needs, and what we're trying to do is weave that together. So please feel, uh, please don't feel that if you're not prepared to take on um, the responsibility of being a private sponsor, that that's all you can do, because most certainly it is not. And uh, please be in touch if you want to get involved. We really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, yes, Jenny, you have your hand up. I just want to say one thing. It might sound random. If you want to be of help, start a kids cafe. Because what about those children that are coming in from another country like that are refugees resettling? And we started up a kids cafe just a little bit before they came, so that they would have a community base as well for the children as well. So 
do what you need to do. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. I think a lot of people underestimate how hard it is to be a newcomer. You know, they think that, okay, you're here now, you're safe, everything's fine. But these individuals are starting their lives from zero. They have to learn a new language, uh, assimilate into a whole new society, uh, get jobs. Sometimes their you know, employment isn't accredited, so they can't really leverage the degrees and the years that they've spent being educated back home. So that has a huge toll on their mental well-being, which can impact all facets of their settlement. So any support is, um, is welcomed and is well-received. And like Aranis mentioned, just words of encouragement even uh, go a long way. So... Uh, don't think you can't help. You can, and no support is too little. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to, to join us today. Please direct all further questions or concerns or opportunities to join in our efforts uh, with the information provided in the chat, um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.